area we have a sphere and then we have a dipole. No, you have a polarization vector P on this sphere. This sphere is permanently polarized. It's an electron. Oh, okay. okay. So you have the polarization of P and then you find what the electric field to this thing is everywhere outside or inside. And that's what it is. Okay, so now notice that uh, this first problem that we did, P was not induced. There was no electric field there, and so there was always a P no matter what you had it there. So I cannot use my relationship between P and E for that problem because P was a permanent for, uh, uh, polarization vector, right? So then the next issue is now what happens if you have plexiglass? So obviously now if I have an epsilon, which is, this doesn't read very well, but this has an epsilon in here, as you probably can see a little bit if I turn the lights off. And so the epsilon inside the sphere is different than the outside, okay? So then for this problem, what we have is a sphere Can I erase this here? Now this is different, because I'm going to assume that this epsilon is constant, so it's now a linear isotropic homogeneous dynamic. Linear isotropic homogeneous I have, That's why I have epsilon equal to constant. And now what is going to happen? The polarization is going to be induced. So what is the relationship between the polarization? E, remember, is equal to epsilon times E, right? And this epsilon, remember, was equal epsilon zero of one plus chi, with chi was the susceptibility. So uh, uh, P is equal to epsilon zero chi times E, right? So now let's look at this for a second. So what is chi? What is epsilon chi? So if I look at this, I say, well, wait a second. I'm going to write, since I have an epsilon zero chi, I'm going to write that this is equal to epsilon minus epsilon zero is equal to epsilon zero chi, right? So this expression. So I can write this as being equal then to uh, epsilon zero chi that I have here. It's just epsilon minus epsilon zero times E, right? Do you hear me? That is P that I have here. <coughs> Thank you. Now, because epsilon is epsilon zero kappa, then this is equal to epsilon zero kappa minus one e. This is p. I can write it in this form, where kappa again is the relative permittivity. It's equal to epsilon uh, over epsilon zero. Okay. So then, well, how do we do this problem? I don't have any sigma bound or anything like that from the P. I have to find what P is from the E. And I don't know the E until I solve the whole problem. Right? And so then, I, basically, I cannot use those integrals that I had before. I can't. There's no other way to go because you don't know sigma bound, you don't know rho bound, because you don't know P. Right? And if I don't know P, I have to find P from the electric field E that I have imposed which means I have to solve for the problem first, and then do it again, 
some other way, which is nearly not what we're going to do. So how would you do this problem? How do we do this in the case of the grounded sphere? You do exactly the same thing as the grounded sphere would do, except for one thing. Boundary conditions are now different, right? What were the boundary conditions there? The potential on the surface of the sphere was zero. The potential at infinity had to go as uh, E0 r cosine theta. Remember that? And then we expanded in terms of the Legendre polynomials, right? This is how we did it. And then we basically got the terms that were linear because all the quadratic, cubic, and solid terms could not match the boundary conditions. So here we do exactly the same thing, but what are the boundary conditions now? condition is well, the potential we don't know what it is but the potential has to be continuous across the interface right so if you're going to have a v out and a v in as before but it has to be continuous across the interface right so that doesn't help but the other one is what this v out is what for me what is v out it's outside so what is the relationship between v and e epsilon the epsilon is epsilon zero, right? So then I have to have that now E epsilon zero minus epsilon E in plotted into the normal is equal to zero. Why? Because there is no sigma free anything. I haven't charged this here at all. So what is this? This is now the potential outside, right? Has to be equal to the one inside. So now I'm going to have a minus epsilon zero R out. As R equals to A, it has to be equal to epsilon dv in dr as R equals to A. Where is the surface? So this is my first boundary condition. The other one is a, the limit of R going to infinity of V out of R and theta. That should go to what? It should go to V0. So it should go to what? Minus E0, Z, right? Minus E0 times the origin Z, which is R cosine theta. So this should go as minus E0, R cosine theta. Right? That's what we did for the ground sphere. Because E0, Z, because this is in the Z direction, and so we know that the E field, right? E is minus the gradient of V, which is minus the VDZ. So this is E0, right? Because this is in the k-hat direction. So E0 has to be now equal to minus E0z should be v. OK, so now these are my boundary condition two. So I have these two boundary conditions. And so now that I have them, what do I need to do? What is V in, in terms of the gender component? You did this problem already. What this should be for? Sum over L equals zero to infinity A to the L, R to the L, E and L cosine. Why? Because I cannot have the one over R to the L plus one, because that is not regular in the origin. Now V out on the other hand of R how am I going to write that term? Well, I have to write it in terms of what it is. And now in the book, they do this differently. They have a first term, which is a induced one, and then the external one. Okay? 
Okay, so they write this as minus E0 R cosine theta plus the sum L equals zero to infinity here of B L over R to the L plus one B L cosine theta, right? Now, you cannot write this this way. <laughs> you cannot. You have to multiply the terms together. So if you do this, you, you will not be able to limit it understand why you don't have a B2 or B3 or B4. And the reason for that is we have to write it in this form. Let me make a, a corollary here. So we have to write it as this, this is equal to the sum from L equals zero to infinity of A L R to the L plus B L R to the minus L plus one. All of that we multiply with B L cosine theta. Term by term. You see what I mean? I cannot separate this guy from this guy. See what I mean? So then for me to do that, I have to don't write it like this is bad. I have to write it, so pay attention to that because that's a common mistake. So I have to write it as class B0 over R square, right? This is what I have here, times the cosine of theta. R square? Yes, because it's the first term, because the, the other term comes, plus the sum L equals one to infinity, and now of B L R to the minus L plus one of B L cosine. So if you think about it, I put this term and the other term together, okay? And I shouldn't have to hold this So basically, I, 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 I multiply my A1 and the B1 by B1, right? This is what I have to have. And this is the inside. So now the problem is done. You've done the problem with. Oh, don't be laughing. Why? Because all I have to do is apply the boundary condition. And the only condition is that the potential has to be continuous across the interface, right? So I have to have the B in as A as a function of theta, I have to be equal to as a function of theta, right? I have to have that. So then if I, if I have this, right, and this is in the limit in which r goes to infinity, you apply this boundary condition to this problem, you can see that all of these guys will have to be equal to zero. epsilon minus epsilon zero times E zero is equal to epsilon plus two epsilon zero times B one over A Q. So B one is equal to, I'm not going to write this like this, and you can simplify this, so you have to have you have to fill out the gaps here. has to be. So what happens with inside? B in of R and theta then is equal to minus 3 over kappa plus 2 minus E0 R cosine theta E out at R and theta now equal to uh, minus 
minus E0 A times R over A change theta, they had to agree. So then they had to have a cosine theta. Had to then look only at the cosine theta term here, right? Which then has only an a in here. So then a1 times a, right, will have to be equal to minus a0a plus b1 times this, okay? This is why the condition. Now the other condition, so you have a1 and b1, right? The other condition is this, uh, uh, so you might, the other condition is this one in which the derivative of out have to be equal to the one at the end. So when I take this derivative, I get that this is epsilon. There was an R in there. Now I'm going to get A1, right? Cosine theta, right? This is what I get. And over here, I get these two terms. So you get two equations, and you have A1 and B1, and then you solve for one of them. I just solve for B1, and this is what I get. And immediately, I know A1. So now look at this, and it is not obvious that this V1 at A is equal to V to A out at A. It's not obvious. But it has to be. Right, so if this is one, this is one, and so this is K plus two minus K plus one over K plus two. So you get three over K plus two. So they exactly. are the same thing. Yeah, so this V in is equal to V out. And from there you get where the electric field is. Now this is important because now you can ask, what is the polarization P? I have a, a, now you can ask all kinds of questions. First, what is the electric field E? And what is the polarization P? Now, you should understand that what P should be, and this is, since this is old problem, perhaps new to you, that's why I do a lot of problems uh, you know, today and the next time, so that we understand this. Notice this thing that P is equal to epsilon zero ka, kappa minus one, right? So that basically means that if I have an epsilon zero outside, that automatically tells me that there is no polarization vector P. I have to have an epsilon that is different from vacuum for me to have a P. When I'm in vacuum, I have no P at all. I haven't polarized anything, right? So then in this problem, when I have an epsilon zero outside, P outside has to be zero, but not inside. Inside, we'll have to have a P because it gives rise to this epsilon. Right? So what is that P? How do I determine what that is? Well, I have to find E. And I only care about the one inside, because the outside is not going to give me any P outside. It should be zero, right? So what is E inside? Now, if you look at this R cosine theta, what is this? This is C. Right? So then I'm going to say that E in, uh, as a function of R theta, is, is equal to, when I take this derivative with respect to Z, which is minus the gradient, what is this? 3 over kappa plus 2, right, E0, in the k hat Right, because I take minus the BDN, so it's giving me a plus. So this is 3 kappa plus 2 E0. Now what is P? Epsilon minus epsilon zero e, right? So then I can write this as epsilon zero, right? Kappa minus one e, right? So then this should be equal to epsilon zero times three epsilon zero. Then I can write it as kappa minus one 
of the kappa plus two times E zero in the k-hat distribution. This is the coexistential vector P inside. Notice that when kappa is equal to one, this is zero as it's supposed to be. So outside there is no P. So now there will be questions that you will have, be asked which don't have to do any math. For instance, I didn't have to do all of this stuff if I ask you for what the polarization vector outside this period is. Zero. Then you should say, well, epsilon zero is there, so that has to be no polarization. But the, for me to find what P inside is, I have to do all of this stuff. There's just no other way. Okay? So now, this is what I will say. So what is sigma bound? What is equal to P now, not equal to S? Right? So what is a normal R, right? So then this then is equal to three epsilon zero kappa minus one or kappa plus two and E zero times R n, which is R hat dotted into K hat is the cosine of this. That's sigma. Okay. So that is now you have sigma bound that you can find E from the integral that we got before. The rho bound is zero, because this is a constant. So rho bound is zero. Okay? So, what we did two problems that involve one with a permanent P, one with a different permittivity, and so the ones that have a permittivity epsilon, then the P is induced, right? And so then I have to go and apply these sort of boundary conditions for this problem, right? If it's permanent, then uh, all this are off, right? I have to then do this thing differently. Okay, so now here is a different problem for boundary. <laughs> and a sigma is equal to zero, uh, a sigma bound excuse me, is equal to zero and is equal to t. And now you have this p inside, which is p0, one plus alpha z, where p0 and alpha, of course, are constants. Okay, this is what they tell you. And it's all in the z direction. Find the volume and surface bound charge density. This is a trivial problem. Bottom, I'm just going to have minus p0. That's it. That's for 
sigma back at the bottom, right? At the top, z is in the plus direction, c normal, the normal is c hat in the plus direction. So now I have to have z dotted into z hat dotted into z hat, but now z here is t. So sigma bound of off is p0 1 plus alpha t. That was c uh, normal would be. So now you have two different sigmas, right? So now what is the total voltage charge density? You can show that the total charge density is the sum of this times the area, the sum of this times the area, and then the integral, of course, over this term in the z direction, and that should be zero. That's a rollback to that, right? So when they told you find the total bound charge in a cylinder of material of cross section A and size parallel to the z axis of this material, right? What do you have to do? Find the total bound charge density. So now imagine that you made a material out of this uh, a cylinder out of this. So for that, so I have a cross section A, right? the same cross section A, and then I have this P here, which is equal to P0 1 plus alpha Z in the K hat direction, right? So these are my carryovers. And so uh, uh, the total bound charge in a cylinder of the material of cross section A and size parallel to the Z axis. So this is the Z axis of this, so you can imagine I have some length here that has not been specified. It turns out that that is not relevant, right? So if I take this to be Z equal to zero, this will be z equals to L, right? So the sigma bound that I have, again, at the bottom, uh, z equal to zero, since this is the minus z direction, this is minus p0, right? Why? Because this is p0, one plus alpha z, but that's at z zero. Sigma bound at z equals to L, well, this is gonna be equal to plus p0 of one plus alpha L, uh, and that's it, because it's in the normal z direction. Right? This is what I have. Rho bound is equal to what? Minus delta t. So this is because <coughs> p is in the z hat direction, this is minus d t dz, right? So then this should be equal to minus p0 alpha. That's what it is. This is rho bound, right? And so what is the total charge, Q bound? Well, Q bound should be equal to the, over the volume of rho bound dB plus the integral over the surface, right? And I have two surfaces, top and bottom. What about the side surfaces? Well, the, the bound surfaces are in the rho hat direction, right? The rail direction. And so P dotted into that normal is zero because K is in the K hat direction. So you don't have any uh, sigma on the sides at all, sigma bound. So when I do this integral, then I have to evaluate this rho bound, which is a constant, minus P zero alpha, and so then here I have to multiply this integral with just the volume of the cylinder, right? Which is the area times L. So then this should be equal to rho bound times the area times L, right? And the other one should be equal to plus sigma bound at zero times the area plus sigma bound at L times the area. And this is Q bound. And so now you can calculate what that is and then uh, hopefully that will be zero. Okay. Let's go move on to a sphere. And I think that I'm just going to outline this because I don't think this is not too hard to do, but we don't have too much time to do it in detail. So you have a sphere of radius A that is has a polarization given by this, and it's a radial polarization. Okay? Alpha and N are constants, and N here is a quantity greater than zero. 
So you have to find the volume and surface bound charge densities. Again, you have to do this from the formula that we have. And the question is, is that you have to find E inside and outside the sphere, and then find V here is a potential inside and outside the sphere. Okay? So I can find where rho bound is, and I can find where the sigma bound is by using the same formulas that I have here, right? So this problem. So I put here where rho bound is and where sigma bound is, but it tells you that P in this problem now is equal to alpha r to the n in the r half direction. Right? That's what they give you. So how do we find E? Finding uh, sigma is very easy, right? What is, how do I find E? Same thing as V, the way we go V is that it was equal to 1 over 4 pi at 0, the integral of the sigma bound of E A prime over R minus 1 prime, right? Plus 1 over 4 pi at 0, the integral of the rho bound of the volume E A prime over R minus 1 prime. Right? Except that you don't have to do this uh, in, in that form. So what is E field outside? So let me give you a hint here, because now this problem involves a, a total uh, a P that it is not induced, right? It's given, right? But I have sigma bound is E dot N and rho bound is, is this. So what is rho bound? Somebody tell me what this rope is? Minus del dot P. And see, because P is all in the R hat direction, right? Then this should be equal to minus D D R of P, right? P sub R. Right? So in the R hat direction. So what is this? I have to go back in the, in, this is a simple thing to do this for the, that's for the gradient, but not for the divergence. For the divergence, we have rho bound is then d, d r of r square d c r. Okay? Because this is an eternal point, right? What I wrote before is if, if p was a scalar function, well, that's what the gradient of the divergence. So then if I take this, what it is, this is from, you know, you can go the inside of the book and find where the divergence is in the third coordinates. So then this should be equal to minus alpha n plus two r to the n plus one. Now 
sigma bound is simple to do because this is a radius a, and so you have to do p dot n, n is in the radial direction, and you have to evaluate p at the radius a, right? So then this will be alpha a to the n. That's all it is, because it's p dot r hat. Right? That's the rate of the normal of the surface. So I'm not gonna do this. So now, what is the electric field? So now, I can use this, once I pass sigma bound, and I have this, right? To do the integral if you want to. Again, you can evaluate it on the z-axis, right? If you want to do the integral, you also, but you also have to evaluate what sigma bound is and evaluate it on the axis as well. Or you can use this trick. And since we're not going to see this, let me... So the other thing we can do is to look at what the divergence of E is. And the divergence of E is rho total. Right? So is not there, so that this has to be equal then to the rho bound over epsilon zero. So now imagine that I, I have this problem, and I apply now Gauss law. Why can I apply Gauss law? Because what I have on the right hand side is radial only, it doesn't depend on the angle, right? So I apply Gauss law, which says that I, I, I now I have the integral over the surface, right, of E dot A, have to be equal to the total charge and force, which is rho bound over epsilon zero u prime over that volume. You see? So then if I looked at outside at some radius r outside the sphere, this would give me 4 pi r squared e sub r at some radius r. Right? This is what the left hand side would give me. On the right hand side, on the other hand, I'm going to have that this is the integral of the volume. So this is going to be 4 pi because it doesn't depend on the radius, right? Over epsilon zero, right? The, the omega, remember dv here, prime will be r squared dr d of omega. So these are primes, right? So what is rho bound? So then this is equal to 4 pi over epsilon zero times the integral of r the square of my rho bound, which is this minus alpha n plus 2, r to the n minus 1, r. And I'm going to integrate this, if I'm on the surface of the sphere, this is just at that radius r where I am. I don't have to do this integral from 0 to 2. I'm integrating over the volume of that sphere, right? This is what I have. So this, you have to break it up into the integral now from 0 to A plus 4 pi over epsilon 0, right? Now, I don't have anything outside because the polarization vector should be 0 outside, right? So yes. I don't have any of this. This is only inside, inside where I have this P. Outside, P is 0. So then 4 pi epsilon 0, the integral from A to R of 0. So now this integral I can do. It's a straightforward integral to do, right? And now I find now E R outside. If I'm going to go inside, then I do exactly the same, but now my surface integral will be inside my sphere of radius A. I go inside to some other radius R. And I do the same problem, but instead of going from 0 to A, I have to do this from 0 to R. So now I'm integrating up to here, and R is less than A, and so I'm looking at the electric field inside, and I get what the electric field inside is. When I get the electric field inside, now I can evaluate what the potential is, right? Which is not obvious. I mean, not straightforward. I mean, you have to have that this is minus E dot dL. So you go from minus infinity to R, if I'm integrating outside, 
If I want the potential inside, I have to go from minus infinity to A, and then from A to R, right? So I have two parameters. So, so for instance, the B, say you have B inside, and R, well, this has to be equal to minus the integral of E dot dr in this case, because the electric field is from infinity to R, and this is R. Minus the integral from R from A to B. R E in always be out. Right? There are these two steps. And so B out on the other hand of R is equal to minus the integral from infinity to R from E out. So how do we do this? We started with this equation. We identified the low bound here was not too complicated. It was basically all radial, and that is radial. Then the electric field yeah, due to that had to also be all radial. And so then I can use Gauss law, because then I fix my radius r, and the electric field has to be constant, and then I can pull it out of this integral, right? But if it wasn't radial, then I'm, I can't do this. So then this is the only way I do this. And all the integrals that I have inside or outside will have on the left-hand side this term. Now when I go and I look at the contribution on the outside, I have to bring this contribution from 0 to A, sorry, plus the integral from A to R. And then when I'm inside, I have to go from 0 to R. So notice that we have done these problems. There is no necessarily a straightforward way in which you apply a technique to these things. We have used you know, like three different kinds of techniques. We, in the first one, you might say, how come I didn't use that in the first problem we did with the P was all in the K hat direction? Oh, there the electric field depends on theta. That's a cloud flat, it's a dipole, right? It's cosine of theta, so I couldn't do this. Because the integral over the air depends on the input. So I couldn't do that. So I couldn't use this relationship. I can use it in this problem because uh, this is a hypothetical problem, by the way. This is not a physical thing. Because the, the coefficient vector that was given was all radial dependent, dependent on any angle at all. It was not in the k hat direction, which meant that it was hard. And it was speed. OK, questions? Some of you are caught either silent for a reason or you are. No, no, no. We've got to go to T4. We have time. It's been an overload. Yeah, right. Actually, this, uh, one, this one's not too bad because it kind of ties everything in together. Yeah, well, there are four more that are progressively uh, estranged from the bad conditions <laughs> of view but not mathematically complicated. Oh, you want conservative problems? Yeah, so uh, Do you have our homework from last week?